good to see everybody tonight. Thank you everybody for coming out. And uh, if you don't know the man standing to my right, he is a, a pastor of mine. He is a, a mentor of mine and a great dear, dear friend of mine. And I've known him since 1994. And uh, I had the distinct privilege of going uh, back in the first part of December to Israel with Pastor Earl and he and I actually had a trip planned back in 1999 to go together and it was canceled uh, because of hostility and so we had the, uh, the privilege of going 20 years later and uh, it was a great, great trip. Uh, many people have asked me, well, what is the number one thing that you have uh, taken away from Israel? And the problem with that is you can't just think of one thing. Uh, I'll give you a story, and then after that, Pastor Earl's going to pray, and then we're going to do rapid fire through this session tonight. I want to show you as much of what we saw as possible, and giving you some opportunity at the end of this time to ask some questions, and, uh, and, and so that's kind of the way the format's going to be. We're look, basically going to look at each day that we had uh, while we're in Israel. We're not going to be able to go through everything we saw, but we're going to pick out a few things. So... Uh, when we get to that, you'll see it. It'll say like day three. There'll be a couple things that'll be highlighted, and then uh, we'll talk about those things. But I, I, I tell people this. If you'll think of the opportunity of having a fish in front of you, and that fish is on a plate, and you can observe that fish. You can look at that fish. You can take note of that fish, and that fish potentially could change things in your life. It's like the gospel. Uh, you know, if you look at the gospel and you've never been to Israel, you can still look at the gospel and open up the gospel and the Spirit of God can change your life. But if I take that fish and the fish is alive and I place that fish in its natural environment and I see that fish where it originated, I see that fish moving around and having its being in its natural environment, then I'm going to see things that I never saw before. And that's the way that I would like to explain my trip to Israel. Uh, when people say that you read the Bible and the Bible comes alive, it's so true. This morning, Greg's reading through the text, and I'm seeing the things that he is talking about. Uh, so, so it's definitely uh, an eye-opening experience and trip, and definitely would encourage anyone that can to, to go and experience that. So I'm going to ask Pastor Earl to pray, and then immediately after that, we're just going to start going through our trip. Look, we want you to laugh. We want you to have a good time. The Bible says this, Mary Hart doeth good like a medicine. And uh, God wants us to laugh. He wants us to have a great, great time. And So this is not just some lecture. We want it to be informative, but at the same time, we want it to be transformative. And so, Pastor Earl, would you pray for us, and then uh, we'll get started. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for tonight that we can come and just share our experience. Well, I know that Ken would agree that it was a wonderful, amazing time yes. to be in the land that you were born in, to be at the place where you were born, or to be able to touch the place where you were born and where you were laid in that manger. Lord, just to be able to walk in places that you walked. And to be able to experience all of that. And there's no way that we can bring all of that back to these folks tonight. But Lord, I, I know that it, it impacted my life in a, in a very special way. And as Pastor Ken has said, just, just in reading your word and even talking about the Christmas story and mm. realizing all that took place and we were right there in the city of David. Right there where many of those things happen. God, we thank you for that. So tonight as we present this, this time, we ask that you would help us to share as much as we can and but we don't want the people to go into overload and shut down because we know it's a lot of information. But Lord, I just pray that you will speak to each and every heart that's here mm -hmm. and encourage them to pray about being a part of a, a trip to Israel so they can experience what we experienced. Because we can't, even our words, the pictures, they don't do it justice. Mm -hmm. 
You have to see it for yourself. And so we thank you, Lord, for the privilege and honor you give us tonight. And we make this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So on December the 3rd, Pastor Earl and I got, and we met very, very early, uh, flew out of RDU and uh, flew to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we got there, and for some reason, I'm not sure why, but I, we felt compelled to go into one of these little gift shops, and I found something that became a vital purchase for this trip, and it's called a selfie stick. I had never used a selfie stick in my life. I had no clue how to use it. It was very obvious. <laughs> And as you can see, one of our daughters uh, commented, said, Dad, uh, this was one of the first pictures I took with it, said, Dad, the whole idea about a selfie stick is that you don't have your arm and your, in the actual selfie stick in it, in the picture. I promise you, I got better. I got a lot better. Did I get yeah, better? Did. Okay. Yeah, he did. All right, so, so we left uh, there. We went to uh, Istanbul, Turkey, and then uh, went on to Israel. Uh, it was a long, long day of travel. Uh, one of the legs was 10 hours. And uh, which is a pretty long f flight. And uh, then we get into Israel later on. We go to our hotel the first night, Tell by the Beach. Uh, they already had it set up for us for the food, and it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, meal. Uh, I'm telling you, this touring company that we go with uh, does it class 1A, and they do a great, great job. Uh, just to show you a little bit about the time difference, it's a seven-hour difference in uh, Jerusalem from here. So that was always kind of a little bit of an issue. You'd always have to remind yourself, you know, that uh, your family's seven hours behind. So the last thing you would want to do is call them when it's three o'clock in the morning over here, right? Next morning we get up, we go to look out of our door, and somebody says, well, we're right here on the Mediterranean. And so Earl and I, uh, you know, we had, after our morning jog... <laughs> Uh, we <laughs> to the buffet. Yeah, to the buffet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, after our morning jog to the buffet, we decided to walk down to the Mediterranean, <laughs> and uh, which was pretty awesome. And uh, and so here you see the day three is uh, where, where we're starting out, and we went to the first stop with Caesarea Maritima. It's about a forty-five minute drive up the coast. And uh, when you get there, <clears throat> the, the, we, by the way, we have a tour guide. His name is Ofer, and Ofer is a, a secular Jew. We, we encourage you to pray for Ofer. He's not a believer. It, it amazed us of how much he knew about Christianity and even saying things like prophecies have been fulfilled about the Messiah, and yet he was not a believer in Jesus. And um, so just, just pray for him. Yeah. Phenomenal tour guide, though. And, uh, and so he talked to us about... This particular place, Caesarea uh, Maritima, and how all that you see there, that you see behind Earl and myself, is a actual freshwater pool that has recently been discovered. This pool from Herod, uh, King Herod actually went out into the ocean, and uh, there was even uh, some of the mosaic uh, tile flooring that they had uncovered there uh, recently. This thing that's on uh, at the bottom corner there is a hippodrome. And the hippodrome was basically where that they went, the Romans went, to bet on horse racing. And so the Romans were all about entertainment and taking care of their body. And so we also saw the theater. The theater was a big thing. The theater here was, uh, in its day, would seat 4,000 people. Now, it, this, this was amazing, because Earl, Earl and I would go up to the top, and you could hear people talking down in the bottom. And so we went to another theater at uh, a place called Beat Sheen. And at Beat Sheen, this particular theater would seat 7,000 people. And I told Earl, I said, Earl, I, I want you to go up in the very, very top. Now, keep in mind, you didn't have any amplification, right, like we do. That nobody had on a, a mic like I have. And, and I said, Earl, go up in the very top. I'm going to go on the stage, and I want you to record what I'm about ready to say. And let, me, so, let me say something right here. Now, you've got to remember, you don't know, I have a really bad left knee. <laughs> and so Ken says, you go up to the top. <laughs> now, you see all the yeah, but, steps. And but, I mean, but, you know, so I, I go up to the top, and yeah. Ken stays down at yeah. the bottom. So I just but, thought but, I'd but, but my voice is a lot louder than his, <laughs> so that's the reason I did that. Okay, so 
so if we could, we could take a look at this. We, we got a little sound bite uh, on the next one, and I just want you to hear how masterful the Romans were at building things. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. It's pretty cool, huh? And, uh, you know, I think the, the amazing thing to me, though, was not so much of their, their prowess on building and how, uh, you know, smart they were about building things, but was when you go to these different places is, like we said before, you begin to see the Scriptures come to life. And like, for instance, this passage here in Acts chapter number 12, verses 21 through 23, on an appointed day in this spot, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last, but the word of God increased and multiplied. To know that that passage occurred right there in that spot was pretty awesome. And you got to so, think, too, as you look at this picture, when you saw Ken, you have to imagine there's a huge wall built behind him. Okay, so it's not, it's not all open like that. There was a huge wall, which, again, just made this whole place amazing when it comes to sound. Because without a microphone, without any electronic equipment, I mean, you could just talk and have a conversation. And it's just amazing, the, the architecture and the skill that they built these things with. It's just amazing. So we left there, went to a place called uh, Mount Carmel. Maybe you know it as Mount Carmel. One of the things that Earl and I learned that, uh, very quickly is uh, we butcher the, the Hebrew language here. And, uh, you know, we, our, our guide was constantly making jokes about how we butcher his language. So not just us, but everyone on the trip. Uh, but we went to Mount Carmel, and that was about a 37-minute drive. You see here uh, in, the, in the text, uh, most of us know the story of what happened there. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. And so what we know is, is that Isaiah, or excuse me, Elijah goes on and he's almost like making light of, uh, of, of King Ahab and his God. He's almost kind of, you know, kind of throwing shade to him a bit. And then finally, he calls fire down, and the one true God uh, is made known at that time. Look at this, though. This, this, this really spoke to me as we were standing looking over this, and our, our guide, Ofer, he, he actually quoted this. And, and then he told us where this happened. And Eliza said to them, Seize the prophets of ba Baal, let no one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down, to the brook, Kishon, and slaughtered them there. And so I wanted to just, once again, show you that the things that we're seeing, the things that we're reading, we're actually seeing. It's before our very eyes, which is really, really cool, you know, when you can put a, a picture to it. So we ended up day three at a place called Nazareth. You're very familiar with Nazareth. What was interesting about Nazareth to me, though, was is that 60,000 people live there today, and only 15,000 are Christian, the majority of them, two-thirds, are Muslim. And we actually saw this in a lot of the places that we went into. Uh, there there at, the, uh, at Nazareth, you see the Church of the Annunciation. And what's interesting about our trip, I know Earl and I talked about this quite a bit, is you would see these Roman Catholic churches at just about every stop along the way. And uh, when, when you go back and look, in the 4th century, when Constantine came on the scene and he began to, you know, make Christianity the state religion, and he essentially said, if you don't believe in Jesus, then we're going to cut your head off. People started believing in Jesus. And he said, if you don't do that, then we're going to cut your head off. So all of a sudden you got this movement of people converting to Christianity. Well, his mother, Helena, 
came a little bit later, and she went on this tour of, of the Holy Land. And she had a guide with her. And everywhere they stopped that was a holy site, she had a church built over top of it, mm-hmm. or there on the spot. And so that's kind of, you get this feel of Catholicism at the same time. It's really an interesting thing as you're walking around and, and observing all this. And then on uh, the next day, day four, uh, we went to the Mount of Beatitudes. It's where Jesus gave his sermon, Matthew 5 through 7, the Beatitudes. That was a, a really neat experience, once again, to actually hear him say this is where he gave it, this area here. And you could definitely picture all of this as it was taking place. And then right after that, we went to the, uh, the Church of Multiplication, but then also the Sea of Galilee, which was an awesome awesome experience and just to be able to see the stories uh, of this from the sea of galilee and i got a passage here that i wanted to read a very familiar one for us one day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them let us go across to the other side of the lake so that they set out and as they sailed he fell asleep and a windstorm came down to the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger And they went and woke him and saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awake and and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? One of the things about this, uh, this location And you see, it's we call it the Sea of Galilee, but it is actually a lake. It's about 14 to 15 miles long and about 8 miles wide at the widest point. But to me, this was probably um, the most moving experience for me during this trip. Because we were actually able to go out on this body of water in a boat. You see the boat there. And we were actually able just to, to, to cruise down the coastline. And as we're cruising down the coastline, looking at all of these places that you can imagine that Jesus walked and that Jesus ministered and that Jesus did his miracles, we're, we're hearing worship music. We're playing and singing worship music on the boat itself. So this, this trip lasted about 30 minutes, I guess. But it, it, was, uh, it was amazing just, just to imagine in your mind all that took place where you were looking. Just to be there and be able to see that. And then understand that Jesus himself walked on this, this body of water. That Peter got out of the boat and walked on this water. And it all, like, like Ken said, it all just came to life. It's like, man, this is the place that it really happened. And, and, and that really just, and again, there was many things, but this, to me, this was probably one of the most moving t- times for me yeah. on the whole trip, just to be on the Sea of Galilee and knowing everything that took place there for me. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, day, day number five, uh, we actually started our morning at the Jordan River. i got to make a confession here. So uh, I am not a fan of cold weather. Ever since I found out I had diabetes, uh, I run a space heater on my feet 10 months out of the year. I know it's a wimpy thing to do, but I do it. And it's, it's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, but, but the idea, I mean, I wanted to get baptized in the Jordan River. I wanted Earl to do it. I, I, I wanted, he wanted to do the same, and so I was able to baptize him. Uh, but I wasn't too hip about the coldness of it because, you know, keep in mind, it was like 50 degrees there. But it was fine, actually. It, it, it wasn't bad at all. Now, what was bad, though, is when you come into this thing, they herd you through kind of like cattle. It's kind of like a business, right? You know, they're, they're, they're getting people through. You've got to pay to get baptized. And uh, so they're, they're sending you through, and they're handing out these little robes. Well, I knew we're probably we were going to have a robe, but what I didn't know is that they were going to give me a schmedium when they should have gave me a large. I didn't think it was too funny, but yeah. I mean. And, yeah, you just uh, got to picture this in your mind. Just, just yeah. let your mind. Get, get that visual get of the that Jordan visual, River. Yeah, I needed to go under, didn't I? 
So anyway, what, what an experience that was, though. Um, you know, I, I can't really talk about this because I'll get choked up, you know. <laughs> And uh, lip will start yeah, I used to laugh at Earl because his bottom lip would always start <laughs> quivering when he'd tell a story and he'd start crying. Well, <laughs> never mind. Move along. <laughs> okay, so then we went uh, on. We went to Beach Sheen. We went to Gideon Springs. And then we went to the Mount of Olives, which was a very, very neat experience. By this time, obviously, we're in Jerusalem. And you see here this next picture, uh, Mark 13:3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and you see over there across from us is the, the Temple Mount area, and uh, which you see the Dome of the Rock, which is the Muslim Dome of the Rock. There's no, obviously, the temple is no longer there. And the Muslims control that area, by the way. Which, this is interesting. The Muslims actually closed up the Eastern Gate. Now, if you know anything about biblical prophecy... What, what does the Bible say that Jesus is going to do when he returns? Uh, and they also put a cemetery in front of it because they knew that ceremonially a Jew would not want to cross through the cemetery going to the temple. Just interesting things that were pointed out along the way. So opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately. So just being able to see these things was uh, just an amazing, amazing thing. And to know that, you know, Jesus ascended from this place. And you've got to imagine here, you can't see it from the picture, but the elevation difference is amazing. I mean, we were way, way above the city looking down on this thing. And so it's, I didn't realize how, how high Jerusalem was. I, didn't, I knew that it was up. I knew that it was up because... Everybody, went, you know, when you read the scripture, it talks about going up to the city, up to Jerusalem. But I had no idea that it was up like it is. But we were up on the Mount of Olives looking down on the city and the walls there. So, pretty amazing. Yeah. Another amazing thing was seeing Earl get on that camel there. That was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it was. That's for that another was day, cool. though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, we went there. That was uh, phenomenal to hear him say that, you know, some of the trees in this garden date back a thousand years. Uh, and just being able to be there and see all that. And you, you could actually, you know, really picture, if you go to this next slide, uh, yeah, if you look at that, you can actually picture Jesus. You know, as your, as your mind is there and you're walking around and you're like, man, I can see this. And then scriptures come to mind and they said, and they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to this, his disciples, sit here while I pray. And so we know what happened at this spot. You know, the, the, they fell asleep. They couldn't even stay awake. And uh, an amazing, amazing thing to see the sites where Jesus has been. I want Earl to, uh, on day number six, we went to a place called Masada. Anybody here ever heard of Masada? Raise your hands. I, I loved this place. I, mean, I loved it all, okay? But there was something about being on top of this mountain, this fortress, and hearing the story of what happened there that just moved me. And so I'm going to let Earl share this story. Thanks. <laughs> it's an interesting trip because we went by the Dead Sea, you know, going down to Masada. And you're going through and you're looking out at the desert. And all of a sudden, you begin to see this huge hill, this hill, huge mountain just coming up out of nowhere. Look at this thing. It's unbelievable when you see it. It's unbelievable. There are 937 steps up to this place. If you choose to walk from the base where they let us off, if you choose to walk up, it's 937 steps up to the top. But we chose to ride the cable car to the top, okay? So we rode the cable car to the top. And while up there, we were just able to see, this was actually King Herod's, uh, Ofer told us this was built to be like a vacation home for, for King Herod. But in reality, he, he never, ever went to this place. But it is actually in three, three different levels. If you're up on the top looking down, you'll see three different levels. And all of it was built to accommodate King Herod and his people. But of course, what happens here is a, it's an amazing story. As the Jewish revolt took place and the Romans began to overtake the cities and overtake the, the people of Jerusalem, these nine, over 900 Jews and their families 
made their way to the top of this mountain, Masada. And they held this fortress against the Roman army. 900, uh, 927, 927, and this is not all soldiers, this is not all men, this is men, women, and children. And so they're defending this fort against the Roman army that has surrounded them. And the Roman army is constantly bombarding them with huge stones, catapults, throwing these stones. And what they're doing is every time they do that, the, the, the army of the, the, Jew, the Jewish men, the soldiers, would go to one place to try to protect the, that side of the mountain. And so the, all the time they were doing that, the, the Romans were using this as a distraction because all the time they were building this huge ramp up to the top of this mountain so that they could take their army up there and overtake the Jews that were left. Well, they succeeded to do that. And so the captain of the Jewish people got them all together right before the Romans overtook this place. And he said to them, he said, You all know what the Roman army does to their captors. You know that they'll come up here and they will take our women, they'll rape our women, and they will take our children and make slaves out of them. And they will have no mercy on us. And so he said it's, it would be better if we just took our own lives before they come. And so here's what they did. They, they instructed every man who had a family. They said, you have to kill your wives and you have to kill your children. So, so the men gathered in that place systematically went through and murdered their own people, their own families. They went all the way through. And at the end, there were ten soldiers left. And they all got together and they drew straws. And the soldier that drew the shortest straw had the, the sad task of killing the other nine soldiers that were left. And then he had to take his own life. So when the Roman soldiers, and the army overtook Masada, when they came, this is what they found. They were all dead. With the exception of one woman and two children who had hidden in a place where they could not be found. And you say, well, how did they know this story really happened? She told the story to the historians. She told them exactly what happened to these Jewish people who were fighting for their lives and finally decided it's better that we just die than allow the Roman army to come in and take us. And I'm telling you, when you... As you're trying to imagine, as you walk around and look at the ruins, and you're trying to imagine the, having to do that to your family. Mm. And just imagine what must have gone through these men's minds as they were murdering their wives and their children, killing them, so that the Romans could not take them captive. It was a, it's, an amazing, uh, it's, an, it's just an amazing sight. And the, just the, the emotions that you feel just knowing that story m makes it take on a whole different meaning now when you think about Masada. Amazing. Amazing. So when we, when we look at the scriptures, when we look at the Psalms, we see a lot uh, where that a writer will you know, connect it to a geographical area, and that's what happens in Psalm 18 too. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom, take, whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. You know, when you think about it, the writers, they, they weren't just coming up with this stuff out of the blue. They were seeing this stuff right before them. So Masada would have been a place that, the, the psalmist writers would have would have seen and known and uh, so to me that that's the thing that I keep coming back to about this trip is 
the scriptures, when people say the scriptures really come to life in terms of being able to see them differently, it's so true. And then, and then on day number eight, uh, if we could go to the next day, oh, excuse me, day six. Um, day six, Masada went to Engedi. That was a neat experience. Uh, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. Uh, what an experience. I, I thought that was Durham. I didn't know. I thought I <laughs> <laughs> Now, hey, I, I got to tell you something. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't look up here and think, that, you know, this all humble guy, and he's such a kind soul and all that kind of stuff. So I am, I'm, I'm walking into the Dead Sea, and I'm, I'm not kidding you. I, I didn't realize it was slick as glass just getting into it. And, of course, he, I'm the sacrificial lamb. Hey, Ken, why don't you go ahead and check things out? And so I, I go on ahead, and I step on uh, the, this, the side of this rock, and as soon as I do, man, I find my feet flying up, landing on my back, and I turn around. You think he's showing me any sympathy? No, he's laughing just like he is right now. But anyway, so, so we, we went into the Dead Sea, though, and, you know, it got my attention with what he said. He said, whatever you do, don't lean forward. Because if you lean forward, you see, the problem is in the Dead Sea, it's so buoyant. It's 34% salt. Nothing lives in the, no, no fish live in the Dead Sea. So when you get up to about not even waist high, your feet want to fly over your head. I'm, t I'm not kidding you. If, you. if you can't float, good news. If you go to the Dead Sea, you can float. <laughs> uh, but, but it's incredible. But the last thing they want you to do is to lean forward because if you go under the water and it gets in your eyes, you can go blind. Well, that got my attention real quick, right? <laughs> so I made sure that I, I leaned back. But here, here again, another scripture. Uh, and all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. So everyone during that time, uh, and by the way, you see how it's recessed, the water line? You know, 100 years ago, it would have been way up higher. And they're doing some things to protect the Jordan River and to protect uh, the Dead Sea, but there's a lot going on there. Uh, but, but a real phenomenal experience. You saw people from all over the world there and they're, they're putting all these, this clay on their bodies because it's supposed to have some kind of a, I don't know, healing kind of thing that makes your skin look better or whatever. It didn't help Earl and I a bit, but, I mean, you know. but it was a great experience. Uh, day number seven, uh, Bethlehem. Went to Bethlehem. That was a, a, a neat experience. Uh, went, went there, and then we went actually to, I shared this a couple weeks ago, uh, the, the actual star there, and you can actually go in and touch the place, and so that was pretty cool. Do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts about that, mm -hmm. Earl? No, just uh, one other thing about, as we were waiting to go, and by the way, this is, this is down in a cave, okay, so those of you who think Jesus was born in a stable, uh, when you go to Israel, you find out that he wasn't born in a stable at all. He was born in a cave. He was born in a cave, and so we're waiting outside our group. There's a group in front of us, and the guide, our guide, Ofer, says, somebody says, well, what is this? We were standing looking, getting ready to go into the cave. Oh, on the right, there's a, there's a door up, up, up some steps, and there's a door, and it's sealed off. And somebody asked Ofer, I said, what is that, what, what, where, where does that door lead to? And he said, well, behind that door is where the bones of all the infants that King Herod had killed when he was trying to find Jesus. Mm. Behind that door is where those bones are buried of all these children that were killed during that time. And so, I mean, I mean, it's like, man, I mean, it's like an emotional roller coaster here. You know, one time we're laughing and carrying on to the Dead Sea, the next time, you know, we're crying, thinking about all that's happened. Yeah, we were like a wreck, I'm yeah, telling you. We were a wreck, yeah. we were a wreck. But just to, again, to be able to go and kneel down and place your hand on that star. That's where Mary, that's what, this is what they're telling us, this is where Mary actually gave birth to Jesus. Right there. Amazing. And then we went to the Western Wall, um, which the holiest site for the Jews 
uh, ever since the temple has been destroyed, this is, this is where they go. And you, you, I'm telling you, many, many, many uh, there. Uh, we went a couple of different times. This, this wall, is so, uh, what really surprised me is how big it is. I mean, you know, you stand underneath this thing, and it's 62 feet, 4 inches tall. Uh, it, was just, it was just incredible to see that. And then the next day, um, December the 10th, we went to the pool of Bethesda. We went down the Via Della Rosa. I didn't know this, uh, but the Via Della Rosa was actually established uh, by the Catholic Church. You know, they put all the stops along the way and, and uh, that kind of thing. We went to the, whole, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Here you see the steps to Calvary's Hill. Uh, you could go up to the top of this, and uh, you could actually um, go up and touch the stone where they said was Calvary's Hill. Now, keep in mind, there's a couple different places that they believe that that could be, and this is one of them. This is the, the church's rendition, the 4th century, right? That This is historically where they hold to. Now, uh, another thought is in this same building was uh, the tomb of Jesus, and uh, or, or supposedly the tomb is where the church says it is. We could not take pictures there uh, because there was a GTB there. I don't know if you know what a GTB is. It's a garden tomb bouncer. That's what that is. <laughs> and and this dude dressed in a in a in a dress comes up to me. I just had my phone like this. I wasn't going to take a picture, but I just had my phone, and he comes up and smacks me on the hand. For a split second, I thought about. I'm not even going to tell you what I thought about, but, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, I'm glad, I'm glad he didn't. I, go it it would not. It probably wouldn't have been a good day because this was a big dude. All right. So, but anyway, um, so yeah, it, it was a great experience. Just even walking up those steps and you know going up there, uh, you could actually envision it. Actually, um, and they say when you go up, this is what they were telling us that there's a hole in the floor and it's kind of enclosed and you kneel down and you you put your hand down in this hole about that far and you actually can feel a stone and they're saying that was the actually the stone that the cross sat on actually of course so, of course the other piece of that is yeah. uh, on day eight we also if you go to day eight uh we 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 also went to the garden tomb uh, which was the other site, you know, the Golgotha's Hill, and it kind of looks more like it. This was something that uh, was established a little bit later. But, you know, here, here's where I land on this. Some people are like, well, yeah, but which one is it, you know? Here, here's the good news of that. The good news is the reason they don't know is because Jesus isn't in the tomb. They can't find him, right? That's the good news. So it doesn't it didn't rock my faith or shake my world, and hopefully it does at yours, uh, but I, I can tell you this, wherever it is, we were right there amongst it. And uh, that, that was the, uh, an awesome part. I think another thing that was interesting that I learned is that, you know, we think of Golgotha's hill, and we have in our minds, you know, all the pictures we see, you see three crosses up on this, on the top of Golgotha's hill. Well, our guide said that in that day, the Romans didn't crucify people up on hills like that. They actually crucified people on the street level where people could go by and actually be right up close to the people that were being crucified. So they could see the agony. They could see the pain. They could see the suffering that if they weren't careful, they would be on a cross like that. And so he said actually the crosses were down on street level where the people could get close and get a good picture of what that what it actually would look which, like which actually that. makes more sense when you read the scriptures and it talks about him plucking his beard and all those things that come along with it and uh, they were right there so uh, going up and punching him in the face and the, so th that that was a neat experience and then uh, the next day day number nine uh, we went to a place called Jaffa modern day Jaffa but also known as Joppa and it was, a, it was a neat little town. I, I really enjoyed our, our trip to Jaffa. And uh, obviously we read about Jaffa or Joppa in the scriptures in Jonah. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. 
And there again, just knowing that all this took place right here was pretty, pretty special. And then finally that day, we only had two stops that day because we're kind of getting near the end of the, the tour here. Uh, we went to the Valley of Elah. And this is one of my favorite spots uh, because I love, I've always loved the story of David and Goliath and uh, what, what took place there. And, uh, you know, what's cool now is I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to show you a picture after this. But I'm actually standing in the brook where David picked up the five smooth stones. Uh, it's obviously not filled with water right now, but there are times in the rainy season where the, it gets filled with water. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soka, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soka and Ezekah. In Ephesine, Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Now, if we could look at the next slide. So there you see where they were. And it, and it began to, to really make sense to me. You know, that I, I love what Greg said this morning. He alluded to this, and actually Ofer said this very thing, that the battle between David and Goliath, because sometimes we put ourselves in as David. We're not David. We're, we're the cowards that off, would, have, would have been hiding in the background, right? But this, the, our guide said this, that this was not a battle between David and Goliath. This was a battle between whose God was the real God, the God of the Israelites or the God of the Philistines. And so the God of the Israelites showed up big time through little David. And the thing that spoke to me a lot, and Earl and I talked about it quite a bit, I always thought, you know, when I'm thinking kid with a slingshot, I'm thinking real smooth stones, real small stones, right? He picked up a stone and he said history and, and some of the like uh, the, the, the Midrash, which is a, a writing uh, uh, that, that is like a commentary on things, uh, of Jewish commentary, they, they pointed to these stones being more about this size. And I'm here to tell you, I, real quick story, I know what it's like to get hit with something like that, okay? When I was in the ninth grade, I got, it's going to be crazy, Earl, but I got hit in the head with a hand grenade. That was after you ate a box of Twinkies. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I, I was in the ninth grade, and I was riding a bus, and a girl took and pulled out, a, a guy gave her a bored-out hand grenade and pulled the pin and said, well, it's going to blow. Well, she, she blew. She went crazy, and she threw it up towards the front of the bus, and when she did, I ducked out of the way, and it hit me right here. And I, I mean, blood everywhere. It was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. I had to throw the shirt away and everything. Uh, but, but the reason I tell you that story is this. It was about the same weight as this stone. It's crazy. And uh, so he, he went on to tell us, our guide, that you, you could wipe out people left and right with these slingshots. And these, these kids grow up using these slingshots, and they are very proficient at what they're doing. And they're not. You know, you know what a slingshot looks like here in America, right? You know, it's got the two rubber bands, and you pull it back like this, and you shoot the pee at somebody, right? Okay. You know, the sling is a, it's got, it's got ropes on it and it's got a sack on the end of it and you hold the two ropes and you sling this thing. And he said, he said they could sling these stones 40 or 50 miles an hour. So you can imagine getting hit between the eyes with a stone that big at 40 or 50 miles an hour. A couple hundred yards away, he yeah. said they could hit yeah, someone. Yeah, we're talking about, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. So th then on the final day, <clears throat> we had a free day. That was a lot of fun. We got, we got to tour around and, um, and, and look clueless like we didn't know where we were going. And, uh, but, but we had a great, great time doing that. And, uh, but we did go to visit the Brahms Center. One of our elders, uh, Dan Bivens, has been talking to us about how, you know, as a church, we really should be thinking about supporting a mission in Israel, uh, you know, to reach, to reach the Jews for Jesus. And so a good friend of mine and a good friend of a couple others here, Adam and Rick, um, a guy by the name of Roman, who's a Messianic Jew, pointed me in the direction of the Brahms Center. It's a group there that uh, live in Jerusalem, 
And uh, the, the, these guys are doing all they can to reach the Jews for Jesus. Now, it's very, very different than what you might think. Because reaching Jews for Jesus is not, let's go hand them a gospel track. Okay? It's, it's inviting them in and let's have a discussion about the Torah. Let, let's talk about the Torah. Let's talk about the first five books of the Bible and let's wrestle with it and examine it. And then their goal is, in that, is to point them to the Messiah, and then they give them a copy of the New Testament in Hebrew. Uh, and they're seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, one of the things that I, I hadn't really thought about until he mentioned it, because I, I asked him, I said, why didn't you have like a bunch of signs out here to le- you know, let people know where you guys are? He said, well, actually, it's kind of dangerous here. Uh, unfortunately, when people find out that we are Messianic Jews, uh, there have been some people that have been cut with razor blades. Uh, there have been some people that uh, some bad things have happened to their families. And he said, so it's not that we're afraid of it, but we just don't want to draw unnecessary attention to us because we want to make sure that we're here to let the gospel go forth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then we were able to go to the Holocaust Museum. That was phenomenal. Uh, if you ever go to Israel, I would definitely encourage you to do that. I think Earl would agree you can spend two days at the Holocaust Museum. It's amazing how much stuff is in there and how much history. Uh, and so then the next slide really just kind of shows all the sites that we saw. I mean, we were moving. Every, every single day, we saw approximately four to five places. And uh, so it was, it was pretty incredible. And then on day number 11, we, uh, we came back home. So I was telling Earl, the three things that I've been asked the most, the first one is, well, what was the food like? Well, it was really good. Uh, I, it, was, it was very, very good. And uh, it was good in the hotels. The hotels did a great, great job of, uh, to catering to us. And, uh, and we enjoyed the food. A lot of, lot of green. It, it, the other thing that's amazing to me about Israel is how much they produce their own food, how that they grow just about everything. They don't export hardly anything. And uh, one of the things that Ofer said is 100 years ago, it wasn't that way. And so God has truly blessed Israel to be able to, to, to flourish in this way. And then when we went out for lunches, lunches were good. Uh, we, we, there were just a few things that you would see at every single meal, right? Like yeah. falafel. And shawarma. And schnizzle or something <laughs> like that. But anyway... But yeah, it, it, was, it was still pretty good. We, you do have to buy, if you, if you go on a tour like this, you do have to wind up buying your lunches, and uh, we can talk more about that. Um, but it's, it's not too much more than what you would see in the States. The second thing is, people ask, it says, well, uh, how'd you get around? Well, we got around on this tour bus primarily, but we did walk a lot. And uh, three to five miles probably a day is what, what it turned out to be. Felt like 50 miles for me, believe me. Yeah. A day. Yeah. I offered to carry him, but he wouldn't <laughs> let me do it. So, wouldn't that be cute, Earl, up on my shoulders and us walking through the streets of Jerusalem? Somebody get a picture of that. That'd be important. Okay. Hey, so, so here's the third question that people have asked me. Well, what about the safety? Did you feel unsafe? Absolutely not. Mm-mm. Especially with these guys that are constantly walking around with M16s. That kind of helps. Uh, but absolutely not. Uh, I, I, Earl, Earl lives in Durham. I think Earl would tell you that he felt a lot safer in Israel than he does in Durham. And, uh, and that's, that's the truth. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. So we wonder, what, what kind of questions might you have? We're not saying that we may have the, all the answers to them, but maybe you have some questions. And then I'm going to show you the last slide. gives you some information that if you have an interest in going with us, uh, you don't have to put this slide up right now, Travis, but if you have an interest in going with us, uh, Earl and I are going to lead a trip back there December of 2021, and uh, we would love to take as many of you as possible. Um, I, I would say it like this. It, it's, it's not even about the money as much as it is about when you have walked where Jesus has walked. When, when, when your guide says, look, not all these roads that we're on right now were built, you know, uh, in Jesus' time. Some of them were in the 4th century. The Romans built them. But the one you're standing on right now, Jesus walked on this one. 
<laughs> I mean, that gets real. And, um, and so you're, you're really paying for an experience. I know not everybody can go or will go, but you really are paying for an experience that's quite like none other. Uh, but what, what questions might you have uh, that we might be able to answer uh, tonight? Any question whatsoever? Yes. Well, for one thing, uh, Ophir was always confident, uh, probably he overconfident. Didn't lack yeah, yeah, he didn't lack in confidence. In fact, that's one of the things that we sort of picked up amongst the uh, the Jewish folks. There is they they were pretty confident, and um, I, I would say that the the tour company we went with. Uh, so we there's a state side here called Imagine Tours, and then there's an uh, uh, an Israeli side called an ITG, and they work together, and um, and so I I appreciated it. Not maybe not everybody would, uh, but but the guy that we had had actually gone to Hebrew University. There, there in Israel, you have to serve in the military. There are a few exceptions, but so when you turn 18, he said everybody kind of wants to serve in the military. It's national pride. And, and so he served in the military, and then he went to Hebrew uh, University. I think Hebrew Union University. And he studied history there. And so as he's walking through, he essentially, from day one through the rest of our trip, walked through the history of Israel. And I, I felt like it was very accurate based on you know, what we had been you know, learned in seminary and places like that. I, I don't know, I, I didn't feel like he was trying to spin anything. Like, he wasn't there trying to sell us a trip. He was working for someone, if that makes sense. Uh, but I personally like the fact that he, he wasn't there putting a Christian spin on it. He was giving us historical Jewish facts that we could take and go look and discern ourselves and, and you know, look into it. Mm-hmm. That, that, that was yeah. me. And I feel, I mean, I... You know, as he as he talked, there were some questions I would have had, and um, some of the things that he said. Uh, but from my perspective, I I know I believe what the Bible teaches about the places that we went, and for the most part, he was very accurate <coughs> in what he shared with us. And so, I had very few questions. I had some, but overall, I would say that it was a very accurate experience. Yeah, I, I don't think he, like he said, I don't think he tried to turn anything or make anything look more than it was just so that people would come back and experience it. I think he was just very open and honest and just from his perspective and from his studies, that's, what, that's the way he shared. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I would have no problem. In fact, I think, it, you know, the uh, tour guide said, or the, the tour company said that he could be the guide on the next trip. So, you know, so. Yes. Well, that's a good question, but so if you, if you can kind of envision everything in Jerusalem, when you go somewhere in Jerusalem, it always feels like you're going up. Mm-hmm. Like, like yeah. you can be, like when we went from the Mount of Olives over to the city, we went down and then we went up. So you were constantly doing that. It was yeah. like down and up, down and up. Yeah. So it could be something as simple as that, that they were going up a hill to get to where it was, and then they were right. on this flat area to where the you know people would walk yeah. through yeah it's a good question though mm-hmm. 
Somebody else, question. Yes. If you were going to take another group, would you have uh, a speaker who was Christian as well, or would you guys be doing something so that it wouldn't be a particular Jewish history, but then also Christian people as well? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that would be part of, uh, we, we didn't have this. No, okay, so we had a guide. We, this was a pastor familiarity trip. And there was a guy that worked with this organization we went with that was supposed to have been our guide, but honestly, he didn't really do anything. And, uh, and so Earl and I have talked a little bit about it, but our, our goal would be that we would actually have time to unpack some of the things that we have seen and talk about. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much of that. You'd have to do it kind of a little bit on the fly because when you get done with the day, you're pretty tired. Um, and so I, I'd even thought about maybe some of the rooms that they had at the hotel. You could have a, a day or so where you come together and talk about some of those things, and we could do that. Yeah. What was the weather like if you're projecting going in December? What, I, I couldn't tell from the... Yeah, it was, it was actually a little bit warmer than here, wouldn't you say? A little yeah, bit? Might be a little, yeah. Just a little? Yeah. Um, there was one day, the only thing that you occasionally will run into in December is the rain. Uh, we, we only had really one day that gave us some problems with rain, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't major. Um, but it was, I, I, I always, uh, when I looked at stuff online, it said just take some layers. And so I had a, a rain jacket that I took with me, you put it in your bag, and if you needed it, you'd take it out. If not, you know, just to... I could, I could, I could be fine with even this walking around. Yeah, yeah. There were several days where it was very warm and very nice. You know, just yeah, very comfortable. Uh, much, like I say, much like it is here. Yes, Aaron. Yeah, the earpiece. Yeah. Uh, th this was actually really good to have. Uh, it, you, you saw some of the uh, pictures. By the way, didn't I get better on that selfie stick thing? I thought I did. <laughs> I, I felt better about it. Um, the, the earpiece was great because as Ofer would walk around, he could be from here to the other side of our church and be talking about a site, and you're hearing what he's saying, and you're walking around looking at everything, mm -hmm. uh, which was cool yeah. because that afforded more time for selfies for Earl and myself, <laughs> and uh, it was great. But, uh, yeah, it was really good. <laughs> Definitely would recommend the earpieces, and they, th this tour company provides all that. Yes, Jen. Not at all. I didn't, I didn't see any no. hostility at all. Mm -mm. Now, the, the only thing that I, I ran into, I'm in a gift shop, and uh, I asked this guy, of course, because the reality is you don't, you don't really know who's a, a Christian, who's a Jew, who's a Muslim, right? I'm just talking to people in the Middle East. And so I asked this guy, I said, uh, can you tell me where uh, the Temple Mount is? Well, you'd have thought I stabbed him in the heart. And uh, so it immediately told me that this guy's Muslim, and he doesn't want me calling it a Temple Mount. He wants me calling it Dome of the Rock. And so that's the only thing I ran into. Yeah. But, I mean, it wasn't yeah. like he was, you know, he, he was actually hoping I'd buy more stuff from his gift shop. But anyway. <laughs> yes, yeah. Rocky. Yeah, how did that change what your life as far as uh, how God's speaking to your life? What was the biggest impact that you saw for yourself? Uh, I think for me, it's just seeing the Bible, a greater appreciation for the Word. Now, I know that sounds terrible. You probably think I don't appreciate the Word, but I do. But, but, but going and seeing what I've been reading about since 1984, and it being like, you know, live and in person and up close, and being able to touch the things and the places that Jesus has been was just like, I mean, it, it just kind of reaffirm, it really recharges your battery, so to speak, of wanting you to go deeper. So what it's done for me, just so you'll know, I've come back, and he made a statement there uh, that put, 
put me on a path. I've already, I've already been a part of a, a group called a Torah Club. Uh, Adam and Rick and some others in our church have, are going through that now. It's basically where you're studying the first five books of the Old Testament and really doing it like uh, you know Messianic Jews uh, are doing it. And even Jews do the same thing. They're going through it. But, but it's going through the Torah and understanding what the first five books of the Bible, how it ties to everything else. One of the things that, that, that it put me on a path doing is we tend to see the Bible through Gentile eyes, through, through Greek eyes. Like, like we, we th- see something, we hear about the creation, and we immediately want to try to reason and figure it out. Hebrew language is not that way. Hebrew is a heart language. And, and so it was just, when they talked about God, creator God, they just assumed that he was, I mean, he created it, right? And so what it's helped me to do is want to search that more. So I, and I, I can give you these resources afterwards if you want to talk about it. But I, I went online, and, and, and actually Roman, our Messianic Jewish friend, uh, recommended some books to me as well. And it's put me on a path to dive deeper into that. I even, I even got a book. When I was in seminary, I didn't have to take Hebrew. I, I, could, I could take one or the other, Greek or Hebrew. Now you have to take both. Uh, so I took Greek, and uh, I didn't take Hebrew. Well, I wish I'd taken Hebrew because it's a fabulous language. So I went online, and as I was looking at these books that Roman sent me, I found one called How to Read Hebrew in Six Weeks. Laugh. It is phenomenal the way this woman teaches how to read Hebrew. I'm already reading some Hebrew, and I just started it last week. So it, that's what it's done for me, Rocky, is it's just kind of, man, I want to learn more about the, the, the rabbi Jesus because we, we, we tend to forget that Jesus was going to synagogue, that Jesus was doing Jewish things because that's the environment that he grew up in. Yes. I don't. I don't necessarily think so. I mean, I. I wouldn't want to. You know, obviously, somebody that can keep up and somebody that can. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're thinking about the the girls, uh, that'd be no problem. Yeah. The only thing I would I would say just because I'm I'm just a little bit older than Ken is. Just. Just a little. <laughs> And I have a few other issues going on as well. Uh, I would be hesitant to, uh, um, I mean, I wouldn't want to keep any of it from going, but you need to make sure that you're able to do a lot of walking. I mean, I'm talking, I'm talking up steps, down steps, back up steps again. Down steps again. I mean, they got steps everywhere, man. I mean, it's, I mean, I couldn't believe it. At one point, we walked 150 steps down into a, a tunnel that came out of our cistern that they had dug by hand that took water from one place to the other. So then we walked through this tunnel, and then I get to the other side and say, well, there's about 100 steps going back up. I'm thinking, you got to be thinking kidding me. <laughs> I kept having to look to see if I still had them. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> I would be a mile behind everybody else trying to keep up. But, but so I would say you really have to be sensitive to the fact that you've got to do a, I mean, we're talking, Ken said three to four. One day we walked 11 miles. Yeah, but that was the free day. Yeah, that was a free day. Yeah. That was Part of that was chasing the train, trying to get on the train. Yeah, things. it was. But It's part of it, though. Yeah. So, yeah, that would that'd be the only thing I would think. It's just, it would be really hard if, if somebody had some, some physical ailments that would keep them from being and, able and to what I would walk. say about that is don't don't let Earl be your guide here in terms of I mean you may look and say well yeah that guy's 70 years old but he's also like the Dick Clark of the ministries the eighth wonder of the world I mean my goodness <laughs> right so he, he he pushed through I mean he really did and because he's got he's getting ready to have a knee replacement that you can be praying for him about but um, but yeah I would I would echo that if you now, I've had some people say, look, I can't do three to five miles right now, but I'm going to work. You, you told me you're going to work on it so that you can, so that yeah. you can go. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think age should be a barrier if you're able to, right. you know, keep up. If you're thinking about going and maybe you have a physical disability, that would be tough. 
that would that would be more difficult um you know being able to because you do have to do a lot of climbing so uh, any other questions do we yes Oh, no. Mm -mm. No, because they, no. Uh, people there know that uh, tourism is the thing, and so they know they want people to keep coming. That's one of the reasons it's so safe, by the way. The last thing they want is something to happen, and they can't bring tour groups over the, uh, to Israel. Th this, this tour company, just so you'll know, that we went with that, that's on the Israeli side, uh, they, they're good at what they do. He told us that they do 70, they, they host 70,000 groups a year. 70,000, yeah. Yeah. By the way, we, we, <coughs> we ate dinner with the owner of the company, right? Yeah, we did. Just, just worked out that way. Yeah. He sat right down and ate dinner with us that, the last night, so. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, it, so it's it's essentially it's ten hours from we're we're going to fly out of RDU. Uh, we're not flying it yet. We had to pay a, a seventy five dollars more, but to me it was worth it than flying to Atlanta and then going somewhere. Uh, but so we fly out of RDU. It would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of ten hours going over uh, if we went the same track, uh, and we would go to Turkey. And then from there, we would fly another couple hours uh, to Tel Aviv. So it's about 12 hours going over and about uh, 14 coming back. There's 12-hour leg coming back. So, but that's very, very, very good airlines, uh, big, big jets, you know, not a puddle jumper. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, we didn't get to go in it, yeah. but we went to Qumran. Yep. We, they pointed out the cave that they believed that the, the Qumran, the Dead, sea, the scrolls. Dead sea Scrolls were, where the little boy threw the rock in and he heard something break. And they, so they pointed out the cave that they thought that that was where it happened. So we were as far from here to, that, to the back doors to that. Couldn't, you can't go and walk in it. But <clears throat> Anybody else? Petra, Petra's in Jordan, yeah. so it's yeah. um, it's yeah. another, I think it's like six or seven hours that you would have to do a day trip. You yeah. could do that. Like if you wanted to go to Petra on your day trip, yeah. you could do it. You'd have to leave early. But you day. would have to leave very, very early, and it would have to be coordinated. You know, they could help you coordinate it, but it would have to be kind of on your own, and then you would get back pretty late at night. Yeah. But you could definitely do it. Say it again. It is not close to Masada, no. <clears throat> okay, yes. First of all, thank you for sharing both your awesome trip with us. I greatly appreciate it. But I do have one question. The robes that you wore when you were baptized, did they let you keep them as a souvenir? I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> it was hard enough just to get the thing off. I mean, I was just... I, I'm having this image in my mind right now about it. Thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> they wouldn't let us keep it. No, should have. I mean, ten bucks. Man. Yeah, it sure wasn't worth ten bucks. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the garment wasn't worth ten bucks. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah the garment. Yeah. <laughs> the experience was greater. Oh, come yeah. on, man. Okay, all right, all right. Any, anybody else? We don't want to drag things along but if you got questions we want to answer them i mean this is good this is the way we learn and it's great <laughs> yes um i know a lot of what you're doing but uh remembering in the past like wow this is where jesus you know lost yeah but was there any place that teaches you where you it just made you really think about the second Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think um, for me it was thinking about when I heard that the Muslims had block, blockaded the wall 
mm -hmm. of the eastern gate. Mm -hmm. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Man, Jesus is going to so blow the doors open on that place. Good luck with yeah. trying to prevent that from happening. <laughs> that, yeah. that, was, that for yeah, me, was probably there. Yeah. And being able to look across and see it when he's talking about it. Mm -hmm. It's like, man. Yeah. You know, then you kind of start looking around, you know, it's like, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? These are all great questions. Okay, so let, let's just let me show you this slide, and uh, you can kind of look at it when we're going. This is, a, by the way, let me say something about the 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 cost thing. The cost that, we have nothing to do with that. Like I don't I don't set that cost. That's something the touring company does. I, I, I figured it out. It's a, it's like 170 some bucks uh, a month if you wanted to set it aside. The reason we're going two years from now is to give you time to save for it, and um, it is money, but. You know what I've learned? We spend a lot of money on a lot of different things. Um, and it, it, to me, it was worth every penny of that uh, to be able to go and walk where Jesus walked and see the, you know, the things that Jesus talked about. It was an incredible experience. So if you are interested, here's what we want you to do. If you're interested and you want more information, uh, our goal, by the way, uh, Pastor Earl's church, he's at Emmanuel Baptist Church over in Durham. We're going to be doing this at his church uh, to see who might want to go from there. But our goal, we, we've committed, we would like to have a goal of 44 people that we take back. Uh, Earl, Earl and I have done some of this kind of stuff before. We did a cruise. I went on with uh, Earl with a cruise in our church. That was pretty phenomenal to take 40-some people on this cruise and everybody be together and connecting with one another so it, it really it really is a special thing to go as a group as a church and so we want to offer that to you uh, you see the dates there if you, you, you may even want to take a picture of that slide just so that you'll have it uh, but the first things first if you're interested then I want to encourage you to take uh, to text Holy Land 2021 to that number and uh, what we're going to do is you're going to get a, just a, a message that's going to come back to you saying, thank you, it'll say something like this, thank you for showing an interest in Israel. Uh, we'll, we're going to be getting back with you with the information. The reason we have to do that is uh, all this kind of happened over the Christmas break, and so Imagine Tours, they're finalizing our, our contract, finalizing what it is it's going to look like. And, uh, and so that's the reason. So as soon as they're done with that, those that have texted to this number, we're going to follow back up with you, and we will um, you know, make sure that you get the brochure, that you'll have that in hand. So, all right. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, our goal was to get out of here by 7.30 at 7.29. Let me have a prayer with you. And then after we do that, Earl and I will be hanging around uh, down here if you want to talk to us about anything. Uh, but definitely text that. Even if you're uncertain, you're just not sure, you want the information, go ahead and text that. You're not going to be obligated to go if you text that uh, number, okay? Just know that. All right, let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity, God, that you gave us to go to Israel. And Lord, we just... We were so moved by it that we want to give others the opportunity to go and see where you walked and see the sights, Lord, that we read about in the scriptures. And Father, I pray that, uh, Lord, that you would raise up the people to go. Lord, I know this, that where you guide, you provide. And Lord, we don't even have to worry about that. There's people in this room, Lord, uh, that will go that didn't really think they could go, but God, you provide a way. And so, God, thank you. Thank you that I was able to share this time with Earl. And I look forward to the time where we can go back and, and share that trip together, leading, co-leading that trip. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for their love and support. And, Lord, just the turnout on a Sunday night. Come out and hear about this. Lord, what a blessing. And so, God, we just want to give you glory, honor, and praise for all that you're doing in this place and what you're doing around the world, what you're doing through Jews and reaching them for Jesus. And, uh, Lord, we look forward to your return. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.